Public Renaissance is a project funded by the Humanities and European Research Area involving colleagues from universities in Italy, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands, as well as the UK. We're looking at five cities as our primary case studies, but expanding these outwards. They're Exeter, Valencia, Hamburg, Deventer and Trento. We're considering the public spaces that are at the heart of many of our European cities today and thinking about how these were shaped in the past during a period roughly from 1400 to 1650. We're interested above all in how public spaces were shaped by the everyday actions of individuals as opposed to the top-down control of institutions and rulers, but of course they were shaped by both. We've a strong focus on material culture, the built environment, but also objects in museum collections. The material culture of public space has been quite often overlooked. Like almost everyone, our work has of course been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. But you can imagine that as a project that is focused on public space, it's particularly affected by not being able to access those spaces. The degree to which cities under lockdown reveal how vital to urban life is that word life. The moving bodies, crowds, pedestrian traffic, varying flows of movement, tourists and workers that animate the city itself. Seeing historic centres stripped of people and life somehow highlights how important the balance is between people and place in the urban ecosystem. As historians, we've also been struck by the analogies that resonate across the centuries and which we hope to share a little with you. In the short interviews that follow, the project teams present snapshots of their research on public renaissance, offering thoughts on resonant objects that speak to us across the centuries of how public space and epidemics intersect in ways that are often remarkably similar to how they function today. The research on the use of public space in Deventer is very much focused on the use of public space for the dissemination of knowledge, learning and, and contents. So the central idea is what could people actually learn from participating in activities taking place in, uh, in the public space. Another important point in the research is the relation between uh, public space and privacy. So on the one hand, the openness of the public space and the safety of the closed private space. So the tension is, I think, very interesting for understanding the present day situation, which is very, very indeed centered on the complex correlation between openness and, and closure. The object I've chosen to illustrate my point is a so-called book of hours, a prayer book. In this specific case, uh, a book of hours in the vernacular, so in uh, medieval Dutch language, as I call it, in Middle Dutch. This text in the Middle Dutch was translated by uh, Gerrit Grote, the, the foreman of the modern devotion, probably the most famous uh, pre-modern Dutch religious movement. Spirituality and religion are I think essential in the discussion of the impact of pandemics. Uh, you escape, let's say, the open space and the open world and try to find yourself back into spirituality and, and religion. In some way, you could say that COVID-19 pandemics is all about space. It seems like health has become a matter of closing the door the outside world and of avoiding the public. So public is dangerous, privacy is safety. This is also what we notice in if we study indeed the impact of religious movements in Deventer during the late Middle Ages. Trento was an Italian city with a strong and very important German-speaking community. It was a border city between different cultures and languages, between Catholic and Protestant lands. It was also a getaway city for travellers between North and South of Europe, with many public houses, hotels and inns. It was finally a transit city along the water channel of the Adige River and the Alpine Brenner Pass. But precisely because of its geographic location, as many other Italian northern cities on international commercial and travel routes, Trento was also the front line of epidemics. Renaissance cities adopted, uh, we can say, innovative measures to control the spread of a disease. Their initiatives provided a model for the rest of Europe, 
with many key ideas still in use today. For instance, they created the first permanent plague hospitals, the so-called Lazzaretti, which served as isolation hospitals or quarantine centers. And as a sort of striking analogy with the present, printed bandy were posted on walls and read aloud in the streets, carrying government degrees and advice on how to combat the disease. We've chosen this fascinating object, which is a devotional banner, visually representing the epidemic which affected the city in 1630, when at least one third of the population died. On the background, we observe a city behind hard walls. It is not an open city or a transit city anymore. We can imagine a city in a lockdown with empty public spaces where austere inns and public houses are forced to close. Preaching and church services have stopped. Doctors and women helping the patients come and go frenetically. Towels and sheets are washed in the river, some other are burnt. And then in a kind of extraordinary detail, we notice that large wine barrels are used as provisional beds for the patients to lay down. While in the sky, saints are pointing at the Lazaretto, praying the Virgin Mary for the salvation of the city. Well, this banner is an interesting reminder that while there are analogies between present and past, there are also many differences. In fact, if processions were a natural response to epidemic in the Renaissance, social distancing was not necessarily compatible with religious practices and public penitential rituals. It's difficult to draw straightforward parallels between today's COVID-19 outbreak and early modern plague visitations. Uh, one major difference is that back then, people in Western Europe were familiar with fatal epidemics. Bubonic plague is not the only contagious killer disease around, and Exeter suffered recurring outbreaks of sickness as it was amongst the largest cities in 16th century England. But the plague, as they called it, was out of the ordinary. It unpredictably killed more people more quickly, it stopped work, wiped out wealth, devastated households, all of which sound horribly familiar to us now. There was a kind of lockdown equivalent because they'd noticed that people and their goods moving around seemed to spread the disease. So in 1603, Exeter's city stewards emerged from the Guildhall and gave special warning that no one should admit into the city any people or goods from plague infected places. The city gates were guarded day and night but despite also being encircled by high walls, the plague took hold. Once that happened, the National Plague Orders stated that infected households were to be completely shut up for at least six weeks, with everyone sick or healthy still inside. The main impact on public spaces focused on keeping people out of them. So, for example, the City Council had to cancel the busy, crowded local fairs, However, the marketplaces seem to be operating as this is where cancellations were publicised. The museum object I've chosen is this 16th century medicine jar made in France but excavated in Exeter. It perhaps stored treacle, not the modern sweet sticky cooking ingredient, but back then a famous remedy from classical times called a, a theriac or an antidote and a chief ingredient was supposed to be viper's flesh, the theory being that its poison destroyed other poisons, including plague. It didn't, but maybe the opium in it felt like a cure. This jar has the words tout ira bien inscribed into it, which translates as all will be well. This 450 year old jar that perhaps contained the hope of a cure for plague has a particular resonance now, I think, as we urgently seek a COVID-19 vaccine, so all will be well for us too. In our project, we focus on public spaces of Hamburg, Germany, in mid-late 17th century. At the time, Hamburg was considered by contemporaries as the most greatly flourishing German city, and you can see a map of Hamburg right behind me at the time. This big city of about 75,000 inhabitants was rich and important and it was well connected with international postal networks and above all it was a transit stop of many trade activities of the time. However, in times of pandemic, all this self-awareness changed rapidly. It was no longer a hotspot of trade flows, 
but the city became or changed quickly into periods of enforced slowness, of non-movement and of disconnecting from these trans-regional connections. The public spaces of the city, usually the places of social interaction, of merchant activity, into new spaces of seclusion and all this allowed for altered perception of the material city. Temporary restrictions on production and distribution of news media change the flows and patterns of rumors and information circulating through the social communities of Hamburg. Any restriction on this cause different behaviors fastly and encourage altered perception of public spaces, of trust, of rumors, of reliable information in the city. The object I have chosen is this plaque regulation of 6064. As it was usual at the time, these orders were announced by so-called decrees. Free trade was closed down, quarantine placed. People in the city were ordered to self-isolation when feeling sick. Bathing houses were shut. Nurses had to live far on the embankments of the city. Beggars and the poor, potentially infectious people, were ordered to clear the streets or to leave the city if possible. The city was ordered from the city's official to calm down, to avoid social life and to stay put and stay healthy, of course. When the individual isn't accessing the material city any longer as he or she was used to, all these places and spaces of interactions change. They change to a non-accessible notion of a static city to a permitted space of regulated mobility. Valencia was the capital city of the Kingdom of Valencia, with a thriving population of around 15,000 people at the beginning of the 16th century. A strong economy based on textile manufacturing and trade, and maritime contacts across the Mediterranean. As a port city, it wasn't a stranger to plague and disease, although the events of 1519 show how volatile social relations could flare up. In the summer of 1519, Valencia's guild's leaders rose up against the nobility and quickly gained control over the city government in a rebellion known as the Germania. Structural factors provide the main causes of the Germania, although pandemic played a significant part in its origins. In the summer of 1519, the arrival of a plague shook Valencia. It wasn't a very harmful outbreak, but the memory of the previous plague of 1508, which had very high mortality rates, persuaded most of those in positions of responsibility and wealth to flee the city. This provoked a political vacuum, and the guilds took advantage of this extraordinary situation. The guilds got royal permission to recruit a Germania or militia to defend the city. From then on, with the guilds allowed to arm, tensions between them and the nobility became greater and greater, triggering conflict and rebellion. Thus, the plague of 1519 and the way it changed the order of the quotidian life in Valencia can be considered the immediate cause of the turmoil the city lived for the next three years. Rather than a single object, I'd like to suggest that the city's public space as a whole can be considered one of the main historical agents of this story. We are lucky to be able to contemplate and visit today some of the building spaces which witnessed those turbulent times. It is difficult to trace direct links between the events of 1519 and the present. Of course, we are talking of a local outbreak and we historians cannot predict what's going to happen in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. But what is clear, as the cases of the Valencia 1519 plague and other past pandemics show, is that these outbreaks can indeed have significant follow-on effects at political, economic and social levels. In some instances, urban populations behaved in quite similar ways, limits on movement, the special challenges to poor and homeless, the stresses on health institutions, for instance. The threshold between public space and the home has become more pronounced, as the transmission of contagion can be prevented by hard walls. In the past, 
plague sufferers were confined to their homes, their doorways were marked by public health officials. Today, we are confined to our homes, above all, for personal safety. In the past, processions animated the streets as people sought divine protection. Today, we do this from liminal spaces, on the edges of our homes, balconies, windows, front gardens, have become the platforms from which we participate in moving rituals of community, clapping, singing, reciting poetry and so on. As countries contemplate loosening lockdown, concerns are turning to what personal freedoms may be threatened by contact tracing apps. In the past, certificates were required for free movement, precursors at the passports. Needless to say, passports arrived and we still use them.